Good morning, Southside. Special greeting to any visitors. We're grateful to have you with us here this morning, and we are remindful of all those who have paid the ultimate price with their lives that we could gather this morning and open the Word of God and worship freely. And so we're grateful to all our veterans and for those in this body who serve in the military. We want to thank you and just express our, our love and appreciation for you fighting to give us these freedoms. We're grateful so much. Well, if you'll turn with me to Philippians chapter 1, we're going to continue our study there this morning. Last week, we left off. I'm just going to begin in verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice, and yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which to choose, but I'm hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and your joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence may, in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. Let's ask God's blessing on our time in this word. Father, our hearts are full that you have given us the word of God. It's inspired by your Holy Spirit and what we hold in our hands is perfect. It's infallible. And so God, we open them up as that very thing, the words of God. May we worship this morning as we understand your communication to us the truths that we are going to see about Jesus Christ in this word this morning. Holy Spirit, enlighten. Let everyone see the glory of Christ this morning. Let our worship be pure, sincere, and true. Let all other things be forgotten, and let us be a people now that worship the living Christ through this word in this time of exaltation. God, I thank you for giving us this word. I thank you for giving us the word who became flesh and dwelt among us and hung on a cross in our place for our sins. God, I pray if there are any here this morning who have never called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would see him this morning and they would see him as a savior for their sins. God, minister to us, I pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, Chapter one of Philippians, we've titled The Fellowship of the Gospel, and what binds our hearts together is the gospel of Jesus Christ. In verses three through eight, we said we're to put the fellowship of the gospel at the center of our relations with one another. Our fellowship, our interactions are based on the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we strengthen one another and encourage each other in that great message. Verses 9 through 11, we saw to put the priorities of the gospel at the center of our prayer life, that we would abound more and more in, in love through this epinosis, this full knowledge of God and discernment. And so we pray and we desire that we would grow and bear fruit and that Christ, God, would be glorified as the one changing and transforming us through his power. Last week, we looked at verses 12 through 18 and that we're to put the priorities of the gospel at the center of your circumstances. And Paul is uh, sitting in prison. He's waiting to find out whether his head will be cut off or not. He has those who are in the, the church spreading the gospel. He said they're preaching it out of ill will, some preaching it out of good motives, out of love. And he concludes in verse 18, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed and in this I rejoice, and so I just want the name of Jesus Christ lifted up. My circumstances are not what float my boat. It's that Jesus Christ would be exalted and proclaimed through my circumstances, and we get a quick x-ray into Paul's heart. Well, now this morning, we're going to look at verses 19 through 26, 
And Paul says then we put the, the gospel at the center of your world and life view. You put the gospel at, at how you think about all of life. How do you think about uh, life and death? And so in verse 18, in this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. And so right out of the gate, the circumstances are not what is causing Paul to rejoice. It's actually in spite of his circumstances or because of them. He's in prison. They're trying to hurt him. A sentence is coming. His joy is in the Lord. His joy is in the gospel. It's in God's people. And that is what is filling this letter. It is the most joyful letter that Paul ever penned from the prison cell. What then that Christ has proclaimed to, to turn every circumstance in the proclamation of Jesus Christ was his mindset. And so God, may we grow in this. May God give grace and peace to Southside Bible Church to be these kind of men, women, and children. And so now we'll take up then our outline. Look with me in verse 19. For, he'll give us more explanation. I know that this shall turn out for my deliverance. And the first question is, what is this Paul, well, this is this trial. Paul is sitting here waiting for his verdict. Will, will they cut my head off or not? I'm, I'm being persecuted. I'm, I'm being sentenced. I, I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. And so what is this deliverance that Paul's talking about? This Greek word for deliverance can mean two things. It can mean an acquittal from the court, that Paul could be set free from the prison cell. It could be not guilty and he could get an escape. The other Greek word, it's, it's used for the soterion word uh, of salvation. <clears throat> Our calling then is to figure out which one does Paul have in mind as he wrote this. And so just in studying this, 17 other uses of this word by Paul, every one of them were for the word salvation. There's two other times that he used it in Philippians. In verse 28 of chapter 1. He said, no way be alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you. And then the famous one in verse uh, 2, chapter, verse, chapter 2, verse 12, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so we see Paul uses this word as salvation, but that doesn't 100% settle it because this could be the one place that he uses it for deliverance uh, from a, the, the predicament. And so the context is the only way we can be dogmatic. And so I'm, I'm parking on this because I think it's, there's a piece of gold here for us to look at. In verse 20, he gives a little more explanation. According to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. And so this deliverance from prison or salvation is going to come about, he says, by your prayers and by the Holy Spirit. And he will be delivered or saved, he says, by life or by death. He just wants Christ to be honored in his body. And just that context leads me that Paul is using it the way he always uses it, that it will turn out for my salvation. I don't think Paul is saying that your, your prayers and the Holy Spirit will deliver me out of prison whether I live or whether I die. So I lean that Paul used it in the way he always used it, salvation. But that doesn't solve it all the way either. Sorry, guys. It's, I know it's a holiday weekend. Keep digging deeper with me. This word for salvation then can have three different meanings. And so now we go, okay, if it's that, what meaning is it? Well, there, there's a past salvation. This word's used when God justified you, when he saved you from your sins and they were cleansed and forgiven. The other salvation is the present. He's saving you right now from the power of sin in your life. And then there's a future aspect of this word salvation where you're going to be saved from the very presence of sin. You're going to be saved to sin no more in an ultimate salvation. So Paul, which one are you talking about? I rejoice in my sufferings and my hard circumstances, Paul says, because it's saving me. It's making me like my savior, being put in prison, everyone trying to hurt me. This is sanctifying me. It's refining me so that I can put Jesus Christ on display through my body. It's not so much that God's turning my circumstances into gold, but he's turning me into gold. He's putting me in the refiner's fire, and this is saving me. 
This is what God is doing in our circumstances this morning. They're a furnace that is to purify gold. He's going to stick you in and keep purifying and boiling off impurities and areas of unbelief and things that don't look like Jesus Christ. It's turning out for my salvation. (laughs) So what I have learned throughout my life in shepherding is that hard circumstances, they don't always turn us into gold. Sometimes they make us bitter and angry, and depressed, and despairing. And so I want you to see as we're journeying this morning, it's not automatic. Trials do not automatically make gold. And we're right back to praying Philippians 1, 9 through 11. God, give me knowledge and discernment of how to look at my circumstances so that they refine gold, and they purify me, and they make me more like Jesus Christ. I need God to show and to do this in my life. So I want you to listen to what Paul says This is going to happen, he says, through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. And so what this is saying is that your salvation, your growth, and even your ultimate salvation, I think, is in view in this section. Both of those things, your journeying to glory, your growing, implies this, that by our prayers... And the Holy Spirit is the means by which we grow and we are kept sanctified and we are brought safely to heaven right back to Philippians 1.6. And and, uh, for I'm confident of this very thing that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus and praying that God would grow us and sanctify us. So we pray Philippians 1, 9 through 11 for ourselves and for each other. Gospel sanctification that our growth, the the best thing you could do for someone is to pray. And so we're praying for one another. I'm praying for your growth, for your sanctification. I'm going to God. God, grow me, sanctify me. I was just thinking verses nine through 11, are, are you praying that? This could change marriages. Are you praying this for your spouse, that she would grow and be sanctified? to walk in the Spirit, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, that He'll keep you and He'll be conforming you to Christ, that that this will turn out for my salvation. You praying for me in these circumstances and the Holy Spirit using them to grow and sanctify Paul. I'll be saved whether I live or die by your prayers and by the Holy Spirit. And so I want you to get this. I think this is so important to what he's saying. Whether your circumstances turn you bitter or to gold is based on your view of life, which is going to be tied to your view of Christ. You can never move from your circumstances defining all of your hope and joy without this to what we're seeing in Philippians. You need this mindset to not be controlled by your circumstances the rest of your life. It's imperative. And what is it? This is the mindset. I'm seeing this whole nugget now in verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and hope that I'll not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And that mindset is the only way we'll ever begin to, see, to live the way Paul's living here with the hard things that God's going to bring into your life and the trials. And so quite simply, what Paul is saying is that your problem is not primarily your circumstances. Your problem is your definition of what is life to you. What is it that you want out of this life? What is it that you're looking for? What is life to you? I'll just throw that out to you. Answer that in the quietness of your heart. What is life to you? And Paul's going to try to bring you to look into this Christian view of life. And it's verse 20 and 21. And so let's go and say, God, shape my view of life through these verses so that I can look at my circumstances and rejoice in everything that Christ would be exalted in whatever you bring into my life. This is holy ground that that we're in. And, And as a shepherd, this is where I battle daily and what I see you guys battling daily. And so, God, would you set us free this morning from having circumstances always dictate our emotions, our hope, our joy, but this unchanging Christ would be the one that we're anchored and we're fixed on 
and cannot be moved away and all of our perspective of life comes in and through Christ. I pray. Come to me, with verse 20. So according to my earnest expectation, and we've looked at this word when we were in Romans 8, and it was this, this word that it means to stretch your head and turn your neck as far as you can stretch it. And it's just, you're, you're just so burdened about what you're trying to look at and what you're concerned about. And Paul comes now, this is my earnest expectation and hope. This is what I'm burdened about. This is the great uh, weight of my heart as I sit here in prison. Well, what, what is it, Paul? What, what has your heart? What, what has you just stretching your neck and looking over the horizon? Well, it's that I shall not be put to shame in anything, that I would not do anything that dishonors Jesus Christ in this process, this trial, the verdict of guilty or not guilty. What burdens my heart is not so much the verdict, but that I glorify Jesus Christ. I just don't want to put him to shame in anything that I say or do. But I pray with all boldness. I don't want to cower. I don't want to shrink back. I don't want to act ashamed of the gospel. I don't want to take the edge off the message of Jesus Christ. I just want that name exalted. And I want to do it with boldness. And I want that Christ shall even now, as always, be exalted in my body. Whether by life or whether by death. Here's this man's passion. It's, it's not, get me out of prison. Food's terrible. There's one thing that has my neck stretched and I'm looking at with hope. And that's that Christ is exalted. And there's what's called an instrumental in the Greek. And, and it's whatever instrument you want, God, life or death. And God picks, not you. And so he's sitting there, I'd be like, get me out of prison, get me out of prison, and pleading. And, at, and Paul's just saying, I, God, you, you pick life or death. My burden is that I glorify Christ in whichever one you pick from my life. I just want Christ exalted. Choose, God, take your pick. But what matters to me is whichever one you pick, let me put Jesus Christ on display. And that is very easy application, whatever he's picked for you this morning. What's the great burden of the heart? If that name is exalted, Paul says, I rejoice. God, to my shame, the instrument that you choose matters way too much to me. Way too much. I pray and tell the Father exactly which one he should choose and which one will help me the most and which scalpel to choose it's never the one I think necessary. And here's Paul just sitting in prison, a piece of meat. He's been beaten 39 times, lashes five times. I think it, it's been shipwrecked and he's been abused. He's been so beat up. And he's about to be dismembered at his death. And he says, I just have a body for one reason. God gave me a body to exalt Jesus Christ with. What does that say to a nation that idolizes the body? I have, a, I have a body to exalt Jesus Christ. And as I look at this sphere called life, there's one thing, and it's Christ. And as I await my verdict, there's just one concern that's brewing in my heart. As I look at my life, there's one concern in whatever circumstance Christ is exalted. I don't want to be put to shame. And I want with all boldness to make him known. Oh no, circumstances could cloud or take away his great aim or desire in life. Paul simply could not be moved away from Christ. All the darkness surrounding him. He's just sitting in a dark prison cell with all these hard providences and the bright light eclipsed it all and it was Jesus Christ. I've quoted him before, but I love when Rutherford was sitting there and he penned, O bright sun, O bright moon, O bright stars. And then he gazed at Christ and he said, O dark sun, O dark moon, O dark stars, O bright and glorious Christ. That was shining in this prison. And Paul's just seeing the glory and the beauty of Jesus Christ. 
that was shining into his prison. That was his North Star in every circumstance. Whatever instrument you choose, God, I just want Christ exalted in my body. And in this, I rejoice and I will rejoice. The great burden of my soul is not my circumstance, but that whatever circumstance God would choose, Christ would be glorified and made to look great by my response. In fact, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If the verdict is life, it's for Christ. And if the verdict is to die, it's gain because it will get me more of Christ. And this is the nutshell that we're going to look at for a whole week next week, that verse. And that is the mindset of the believer, and it makes you untouchable. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I pray that God would deepen that in each and every heart here this morning. So how do we get there? <clears throat> how do we get that mindset? And I think it is Philippians 1.21 is the answer. And so we're going to close out next week. We'll look at that. We'll go to the communion table, and, and we'll bring our gaze and remembrance back to Calvary's tree. And it's there that this mindset and heart is born and that it's nurtured. Looking to him, considering Jesus, but now, but God, um, that is the mindset of the believer. And so let's, I just want to continue with this passage this morning, and then next week we'll circle the wagons back to verse 21. I, I'm calling it sanctified logic. Uh, Paul will flush out the two conclusions. So he wants to look at it a little more uh, if he chooses, if the uh, Nero or the king chooses life, or if he chooses death. I just want to weigh these two things this morning on a scale. And so just don't forget what we're weighing, <laughs> life or death. This isn't something small. And let, let's, let's just watch the Apostle Paul put these two things on a scale. How does he think about the two options that before him? Does, does Paul have a preference? These verses are very interesting because once again, we learn much from Paul's thinking on the two possible outcomes of his circumstance that he finds himself in. So we're going to look at Paul's dilemma and 22 through 24, and then 25 through 26, Paul's conclusion. So the dilemma is he's in a conflict. And I want you to catch this. His conflict is, do I want to go to heaven or do I want to stay on earth? That, that stops short of the real conflict in Paul's heart. I think, I think that's how I, I would have looked at it maybe. But he goes deeper than the surface. And he gives us some great insights on how we're to think about our life and how we're to think about death. If I get life... It's going to be labor for the name of Jesus Christ on this earth. And if I get death, I'll be united with him in death. And so it's just amazing that there's just two realms that Paul can think in. It's very simple. He boils it down. It, it, the intricacies of life matter, but he gets them always down to these two manageable points. And I just, if you like simplicity of life and purpose, here it is. He looked at this, death is gain. It's to be with Christ. Life is fruitful service for the king. I want to serve Christ's people. How? By helping them see Christ clear, to be, behold him and become like him. That's all he could think is Christ, Christ, you behold Christ. I get to behold Christ. Cut him open. He bleeds Christ. You couldn't get it out of him. It's amazing how he thinks. Look at, come to verse 22. But if I'm to live on in the flesh, it will mean fruitful labor to me, and I don't know which to choose. And so the verdict is not guilty, and I get to live. I, I think about it in this way. So, Paul, you're going to get life. What will you do with it if you get out of this prison? Well, it, it'll be fruitful labor. All I can think of is if they let me out, I, I'll labor for Christ. So how do you view your life? This could show why you struggle so much with your circumstances, blocked goals, over desires, building your kingdom, trying to get your own satisfaction. If that is your life, you're, you're, just, you're always going to be frustrated, mad, exasperated, despairing. It's just, you, you, this is the shift that must take place. For Paul, life was Christ. His goal was to labor to see Christ formed in the church and labor to see Christ formed in you. He said to the Corinthians that that's my desire. And we call that the, the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit 
of Christ's likeness, the fruit that we looked in verses 9 through 11, that having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. If I get life, I will abide in Christ, and in and through him, love will abound more and more, and the fruits of righteousness will flow and be filled up, says Paul. My life is simple, to love Christ. And to love Christ is to love his people and to serve them and to serve them in such a way that it will produce fruit. Make me a servant. I want to bear fruit for God. If I get out of this prison cell, it's not, uh, I just want to get back to Rome and eat their food. I want to breathe the ocean air again at the Cinco Terra, places I've not traveled to yet. I I want to go say goodbye to my family. I I want to accomplish something that outlives me. Uh, I I have a a bucket list, and there's still some things in the bucket. I wonder what would have been my burden if I got out of prison. For Paul, it was one thing, fruitful labor. Have any of you ever had a life-changing time or come out of something really difficult? I remember when our dear sister Samia was with, uh, battling cancer and she was waiting for a result on how far it spread and she just said, you know, God's good either way. Uh, it just made me think of God picked the instrument, spread cancer or, or decaying cancer, uh, whichever one, I just want to glorify you. Have you ever, I've almost been in an airplane crash, at least I thought, I probably exaggerated it, but it, it made me enough to where I went, ah! You're like embarrassed. And, but you, you get out of that crash, and what are you going to do with your life? Maybe you blew it at work, and you lost your job. A huge failure. Or you're, you're turning 50, and you, you look at your life and go, how do I want to spend the rest of it? You've raised your family. What, what do I want to do with my life? I got in trouble a while back. Uh, I, I said, are you just going to go collect seashells? I, I stole it from Piper, so if you were hurt, it was him. It's his fault. Just, are you just going to go collect seashells? I'm not against seashells. What, what I'm against for me to live is Christ. And I just want you to check yourself. What is life for you? What is it? Paul, it's, it's fruitful labor. Abide in me, and Jesus said, you'll bear fruit that will remain. Is that the passion of what you want to do with your life? How do you think about life? It's got to be answered this morning. And it it could even be a salvation issue. You could have played in church your whole life, and this morning God's bringing it to a head. Life as I add Jesus to get my own life and what I want. This is bringing you right to a head. Are you going to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow after Christ? Dads, the fruit of your wife and children, the passion of your heart, or is it the call of duty or video? I don't even know what video games are out there, praise God. But is it to be a CEO? Is it to be an elder and forsake your family in the service of supposed God? Moms, such a calling that can be unrewarding and demeaning in our culture to stand up and exalt motherhood and give your life to these children. Retirement age. My hero is Harold Wood battling Alzheimer's and he just gets in here and serves this body day in and day out. If he gets life, it's to serve the body of Christ. Praise God for our examples that we have right before us. Singles. Paul said you can be single-minded in your service to him. I wish I could have back some of my single years. When I look at Zab and Catherine and Mariah and Burdick opening the service and guys, Zenzen giving his life to make meals and share the gospel. I just, one life, if I get it, it's to serve Christ's people not to spend all my days wanting something different. I just pray, if God gives you life, it's Christ. Serve. What's life to you? 
For Paul, it's Christ and it's fruitful labor. What's your dilemma, Paul? Well, come with me to verse 23. I'm hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. The word for desire, this strong, intense Greek word, Paul has such a strong desire. He's hard pressed on both sides. It was used in reference to an army pressing in around you in Luke 19, 43. So what we have here is two desirable alternatives for Paul. It's not kids, if mom says, do you want kale or broccoli for dinner? I hope everyone hates kale and broccoli. You should. It isn't choosing between those things. Your options are good. Paul's saying, I'm hard pressed. They're good options. Cut my head off or don't. I, I like both alternatives. But isn't one get, getting your head off like, well, how is that a dilemma? Paul, I, I know. I'd be like, I don't want my head cut off. God, would you please turn Nero's heart? Let me, be, let me get out of this prison. I'll preach Jesus harder if you let me get out of prison. But one desire on this scale, one is greater than the other. There's one that's tipping the scale more than the other option for Paul. I got a strong desire for one. Which is it, Paul? Well, I want to depart. I want to, I want to go. Who wants a sword to come down upon your neck? It's what follows that changes it all for Paul. I want to depart and be with Christ. That's the only reason I want that. I don't like swords around my neck. I want to be with Christ. I don't want to have to, 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 to not see him. I want to see Jesus. I want to be in his presence. I want to get there and not have sin interrupting my fellowship with him any longer. I just want to embrace him. I want to no longer have all the world tempting me and all this stuff. I just want him. And he says, that is very much better. And we say that is horrible English it's bad Greek, but one of the sweetest things I think I've ever heard pinned. Jesus said, look at the birds of the air that they do not sow, neither do they reap, nor do they gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not worth much more than they? <clears throat> it's an emphatic superlative. And so Paul has the, the best desire and logic a man could have this side of glory. Oh, to depart if God should choose that option, it is gain. It is very much better. I get all of Christ unhindered for all of eternity. I get the prize, Christ. And next week we'll flush that out. But how can we grow and get to this place that we don't run from death, but we see the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth? How do I get to that place? And I believe we need to get to that place because I think that's the whole mindset of why Paul could look at it this way. And I want you to be set free if, if fear of death is controlling you. So how Paul embraced when the Spirit told him he was done. So I want you to see later in Timothy, Paul did not run from it because he's gonna know that I'm gonna be delivered from this. But he says in Timothy, when he knows it's done, he says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I've kept the faith. In the future, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but all who have loved his appearing. Paul walked right into it and he walked into it as gain very much better. Look at me in verse 24. Yet, to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Paul's not just guided by his personal desires. Paul's pastoral concern now shines out. He looks out at the needs of the Philippians and the gifts that God has placed within him by the Spirit. Paul is not haughty. He's not thinking he's something special. He knows that God has called him to be an apostle, and he's put within him grace gifts that are all from God through him and to him. This isn't arrogance. They're necessary, he says, for your good. And so I, I need to stay. I need to stay. It's an amazing statement when you think about how much Paul wanted the gain. 
He wanted that very much better. And I look at the needs now and he says, and I'm gonna stay because it's necessary for your joy and the faith. I wonder if we think of the saints in that way. I have this great desire for gain. Bring me home, Jesus. And why I wait, I'm just gonna sit in my living room. But I will not die until Christ is done using me for fruitful labor. I'm ready. This is just so pastoral and rich. He's going to write in the next chapter, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. And here's Paul at his best. My interest is it would be very much better if I could die but I'm looking out for your interests and you give me life and I'm going to serve you for the glory of Christ. So that's Paul's dilemma. And then he gives us his conclusion, verses 25 and 26. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for the progress and joy in the faith. And so in verse 12, he's rejoicing that he's in prison and the gospel is making progress And now he's rejoicing in verse 25 for the progress of the Philippians and their faith. I want your progress and your joy in the faith. And your joy is by faith in Christ Jesus. So I want to present him to you. I want you to see Christ from every angle. And anyone who believes in Christ and looks at him with a believing eye will find joy. Even with tears running down your face. Paul said, I despaired of life at one point. I want you to see more of Christ as he has said his joy in Christ. Paul says, I want to be a minister for your joy. And that is that Philippi, that you might understand for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. You get that and your joy is going to be made full. It's a fullness of joy when you see Christ in this way as your all in all. Paul said in Philippians 2, do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in this world, holding fast the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may have cause to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering, upon the sacrifice and service of your faith. I'm I'm dying. I'm being poured out as a drink offering for your faith. I rejoice and share my joy with you all. And you too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. And in verse 26, there's an ultimate purpose. So that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. If not guilty, you'll have the grounds for glorying in Christ. We glory in the realm of Jesus Christ. So here's our principle. Paul wanted to be with Christ, whom he loved and served more than anything else. He lived with an eye to this day. He urged and hastened its coming. It was very much better if he could get there. Yet he denied this great desire to serve the saints. And this is not sitting up in an ivory tower saying for me to live as Christ. This is love to Christ will be worked out in serving his people, his saints, and taking the gospel to unbelievers. And so we've studied the law of Christ under the new covenant. And it's love to Christ for me to die as gain because I love Christ. And for me to live is I love the saints at Philippi and I want their progress and their joy in the faith so that it'll bring glory to Christ. This is what the gospel does to a heart. So here's my question for us. Do you put the converts of the gospel then at the center of your principled self-denial? That there's a, there's a, there's a self-denial in serving the saints of God. And Paul says, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. I'm dying, giving my life for the service of your faith. This is where service to Christ is manifested. You serve Christ by serving his body. 
On the last day, I love when Jesus shared, there's gonna be the separation of sheep and goats and he's gonna separate them and, and say, you know, I was sick and naked and hungry and in prison and you did not come to me. And they're gonna be like, when did we see you that way? When? And, he, and he's gonna say that when you, when you did it to, to the least of these, you did it to me. And so we have to get this, that we deny ourselves to serve the converts of the gospel. So if you give me life, I'm going to use it and pour it out for the good of God's people. And that's going to bring you into question. If that's not your heart, you're just always going to be frustrated with your circumstances, with the trials. You'll always be stuck until this breaks in, that my life is it's for Christ. And he will use all of these things to refine gold and to bring more glory to Christ. So the conclusion is that these partakers of grace, that God began a good work and he'll complete it. And we seek the spread of the gospel, uh, not personal reputation or gain. We seek all what then? I just want Christ proclaimed in verse 18. And there's gonna be hard times in death. And as I look to the future, my neck is stretched, looking to see if whatever you bring into my life, God, I just want to exalt Christ and not put him to shame. Whatever instrument you choose, even death, we'll look at next week. I just want to exalt Jesus Christ. And if I have life, it's just for Christ. I'm going to live for him, and I'm going to serve his people. And if I get death, that's going to be gain. I'm going to go be with him forever. That's That's what we're running for. That's our chief end. To die is gain. Is there anything I'm holding on too tightly to see this as the finish line, to see it as your wedding day? Encourage one another to think about this. I think the American church is too focused on staying alive instead of what we're looking at in Philippians 1. I love when I hear a story about a man who proposed to his fiance and he just said, how do you feel about me dying. I want to go to a people group that they're going to kill me most likely if I share it. So I just want you to know if you're going to marry me, uh, most likely you're going to bury me. And she said, I feel great. <clears throat> and she meant it. <laughs> and she meant it. That's Philippians 1 kind of stuff with people sitting right in your church. This brings joy and it makes us untouchable. So just in closing, I think this thinking is so foreign to some of us sitting here this morning. Your life is just about you and what you want and what you desire. And you feel like I'm talking a foreign language. You're like, I didn't know pastor knew Hebrew or Greek. I, I don't understand what he's talking about. And, and the message is to repent, to change your thinking. And think rightly about your life and death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And if you've drifted so far into the American dream, I'm just asking this morning that you repent before God and say, I've lost what Christianity is all about. God, bring me back to ground zero to have this kind of heart. And then there's some where your life is just, it's just you at the center reference point. And, and you're not drifting. This is just who you are. And your whole life is, you're, you're just using God. He's just added on to the centrality of you trying to have a happy life, fix your life, be God, and run your life. And you're sitting here at a, at a crossroad that God is calling you to come to him and to take up your cross and die and come follow after Jesus Christ. You have been using God your whole life instead of bowing and surrendering and following him. And if that's where you stand this morning, I want to invite you to the sweetest one who said, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden from trying to be God and run your life and clean yourself up and get accepted. And I'll give you rest for your souls. And then to live will be Christ. And to die will be gain because you just want more of Christ. So I bid you, come to Jesus and be saved. And let him become the center and the Lord of your life and the heart of all your aspirations. And quit using him. Just 
quit using Jesus. He's a savior. He wants all of your life or nothing. I, I like that saying. He doesn't want a makeover. He wants a takeover. And so don't stop short of coming all the way to Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I thank you for the beauty of what's in this passage, Lord. It, it opens us up quickly. It reveals a lot of wrong motives. But it, there's so much hope because it reveals why my circumstances dictate my joy, my peace, my life. God, I pray that Jesus, the one who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, would become what our life is built on. I pray that we could sit in a prison cell and the only burden of our heart would be, how do I glorify you, Jesus? You pick. You pick whatever execution, free or executed. Just give me grace to make you look really good, whichever one you pick. God, grow us in whatever prison cell we're sitting this morning. And we're just trying so hard to manipulate you and get you to do what we want. I'm trying to get you to, to pick our instrument. God, let every hand be opened at the throne of Jesus and ask whatever instrument you want, God, you pick. Mine is to follow and to surrender and to exalt Jesus Christ. And so I pray, Lord, that in every heart, the burden would be, I just want to exalt Jesus Christ in my body, whether by life or by death. God, work deeply in our American earthly hearts I treasure this world way too much. God, set us free. What you're calling us into is freedom and blessing and joy. Paul's saying this is the mindset that brings about joy. And I pray that you would bring us into this deeper and you would teach it sweetly into our hearts. This isn't a bid to come be miserable. This is a bid to come find ultimate joy and peace. God bless the saints of God this morning. And for any who have just kept you 10 miles from their life, but walk into church every Sunday, God, this morning, let there be a marriage between them and Christ. Let it be over. Let them surrender and bow that knee in faith and repentance before Jesus Christ and let them find eternal life. I pray this in the name of Christ. Amen.